The Translator by Aaron Vleck Having settled into my rooms at the Essex house, I sat before a roaring fire, taking stock of things. The Essex was a huge, rambling old pile of many rooms turned out for lodgers by a certain Miss Essex after the sudden mysterious death of both her sister, Miss Clara, and her companion, a Miss Carlyle. The mansion was impeccably maintained and handsomely appointed, boasting five floors and half a dozen stately suites, as well as an immense attic which was, we were frequently reminded, strictly off-limits to all but Miss Essex herself, and for which she alone possessed the solitary key. I had chosen the ancient seaside burg of Fisher's Keep for its remoteness from larger towns with the usual bustling holiday throngs and the tendency for friends and relations to just pop in unannounced, suitcases in hand. I wished ardently to avoid such intrusions in this, my self-imposed exile. My rooms at the Essex were three, a luxurious salon with a huge fireplace and three tall windows facing the sea, a formal parlour which I transformed into my library, and a small but comfortable bedchamber. The furnishing and draperies were dark and luxurious in just the right way to ensure the desired ambiance by the candlelight I had always favoured. Miss Essex ran a fine establishment for myself and five other similarly reclusive denizens. A hearty breakfast was set out at 7.30 in the morning, and a formidable supper appeared at 8pm sharp, at which all lodgers were present as Miss Essex's table rivaled the best dining establishments in town. Port and sherry were served by the fire at 10 for those wishing to partake in the social virtues of the common room, Then our hostess resumed the entire programme with the risen sun. No irony was lost that such lodgings were the sort preferred by many an old curmudgeon in the books on spectral hauntings and far-flung expeditions I devoured with the greatest enthusiasm. Chambers, Merritt, James, Vleck, why, even old H.P.L. himself made ample use of this trope, and now here was I, embodying the very same suffering a tedious malaise of the soul. I might have remained ensconced within that faded isolation for a day, months, or perhaps never have ventured forth but to my grave. You see, as a wordsmith by calling and compulsion, by profession and by cosmic decree, I had been transformed into a creature of strange nocturnal habits, who could savour no peace nor taste the supreme raptures of ethereal joy, unless under the domineering yoke of a new tale, some piquant ballyhoo of the mind and spirit suitable to those excitations typical of a certain breed, long known to this world yet hidden as any ghost or ghoul, harrowing the frayed and tattered underskirts of decent society. After a long and heroic battle, I had finally succumbed to that most ignoble disquietude of mind, in which, shall I say it plainly, the pen in doth runneth dry. It is a creeping, interior rot that ensnares the mind in a grasp more crippling than the terrors of the darkest demoniac curses rained upon the wretched heretics and alchemists of old. I resign myself to retire from the world to suffer my wounds in private, to recover fully, or to perish, perhaps even by my own hand. After some weeks my vellum still remained unmolested upon my desk. As the weeks sped by I became a mere spectre of myself as the tightening noose, the discharged revolver and the odious tincture leered impatiently at me from the darkened corners of the room. Wandering alone at dusk, I savoured the fog as it rolled listlessly through the empty streets in ghostly waves, lapping at shuttered windows and giving cover to all that lurked in the shadows taking my measure, waiting for an auspicious moment to strike me down or such was my febrile indulgence as I sought the dimming embers that gave wing to the fancies which bore me aloft and kept me sane. By day I kept to my rooms, pen and vellums at the ready, waiting for that whisper 
that might never again return me to the uncanny life that lured me forever beyond the grasp of this world. I had, you see, become a ghoul in all but the flesh, unfit for anything but seclusion and the intimate darkness of concealing places. I endured in this manner for some time, abysmal in my inner ministrations, emerging from my rooms only for meals and my nocturnal meanderings, which took me further and further afield from the pleasant lanes and cheerful dwellings of the quaint seaside town and the wholesome bastion of Miss Essex's establishment on Whippoorwill Lane. Yet, not so much as a single blasted word surfaced to this dying shade adrift in the vast and silent sea. Yes, of course, I could have strung together any number of thoroughly banal words across my pages, such as Mr. Smith began his uneventful career in the offices of such and such barristers, or perhaps the room was empty and quite cold, bereft of life, but the sightless old man and his equally blind and ancient mutt, but I had no taste for such nonsense. It was quite the surprise when one evening, decidedly past ten o'clock, there came a sharp, insistent rap at my door, muffled as by gloved hand, demanding, yet curiously melodious, no one ever visited my rooms. My fellow lodgers guarded their own privacy as jealously as I did, and Miss Essex would never appear at this hour unless there was something amiss. Swinging the door open, I found a man upon my doorstep, buried in the thick, dark folds of a heavy greatcoat, a wide-brimmed hat of foreign design upon his head, thick leather gloves, dark impenetrable glasses, and leaning heavily upon a curiously carved walking stick. Utterly speechless, I wondered how anyone could gain entry to our abode at this hour unannounced, and actually ascend to my very door and plead entry. Yes, what is it? I demanded. Who the devil are you? And why on earth do you call upon a man at such uncouth hours of the night? I bellowed. Mr. Blackwood. The voice came in a hoarse and sibilant whisper remote and almost inaudible. Yes, what do you want? I parried. Might I add, Professor Blackwood. The strange voice came again. I felt like a cornered hare, foxes of unimaginable danger menacing me in the gloom of a half-remembered dream. Well, yes, although it has been rather a long while since I have been summoned by that title. So again I ask, why are you here? And what is your reason for calling upon me at this hour? If you would but permit me a brief audience, I am quite confident our few moments together will yield much to our mutual advantage. For unless your early research, foreign expeditions, and numerous rare acquisitions are all forgotten and cast by the way, it is indeed the esteemed Professor Blackwood, whom I seek. May I come in, sir? He said, doffing his hat briefly to reveal a grizzled head of a malign hue, plagued with a few short and remarkably unruly, wiry hairs. Then the hat was quickly returned to its sickly pate, and the broad mouth and thick rubbery lips twisted slowly into what I could only take for an attempt at a smile. This too faded, and we stared at one another in silence. The matter, he continued, pertains to certain old treatises familiar to you from your days at Miskatonic University's Library of Antiquarian Rarities and Forgotten Cultural Remains. May I enter, sir, or shall I depart? I assure you the matter is of the greatest urgency, and I am not without some danger to my person in this regard, he concluded, glancing furtively about the darkened hallway as if it were teeming with all manner of unseen assailants. Now, I happen to be possessed of a reckless disregard for all things when I am on the scent of anything even possibly outré, and I bristled with curiosity and was hopelessly intrigued. 
I stepped aside and bade the man enter my domain and seat himself by the fire, which he did with obvious relief. I asked for his hat and coat, but he declined, saying they afforded him a necessary comfort, and he never ventured forth from his lair, that was the very word he used, in any other manner. The blighter had me, and we both knew it, with those three dreaded words. Miskatonic University Library. I poured myself a stout drink and offered him the same, which he refused with a wave of a still-gloved hand, and I wondered if he had suffered some tragic misadventure that left him disfigured. I soon abandoned that theory when my visitor's nature became all too clear. It was with foreboding and trembling excitement that I sat there on the edge of my chair, barely daring to breathe. I knew as that fellow Doyle so often uttered through the lips of his puppet Holmes, the game was surely afoot. Well, out with it then, I demanded. I know well enough what manner of creature you are, but still not why you stand upon my doorstep in the dead of night. Yes, just so, he said in that characteristic guttural chirp. I intend to pay most handsomely for your time and troubles, if you find it in your best interest to aid me, he mumbled, pushing a worn leather pouch in my direction, whereupon I heard its contents tinkle dully within. Nonsense, I roared. I have no need of your coin. But if you have a caper worth considering, I may agree to become involved in some small way. Please. Take the bag, examine its contents, if for no other reason than to indulge me. Very well, but I have said all... I was cut off before I could finish my thought, as a number of large rough coins tumbled heavily into my hand. Here were Spanish doubloons, Roman coins bearing the image of Caesar Augustus, as well as others from the deepest reaches of antiquity. But it was four small coins that caught my breath and forced a gasp from my lips. They were deep green and bore the gruesome visage of a creature utterly alien to this world and an abominable script I had not set eyes upon since my days at Miskatonic. The stranger nodded slowly and once again proffered that same disquieting smile that I wished upon my soul he would keep strictly to himself. Proceed, please, I said in a near whisper not so different than the stranger's own. But keep these. I have no need of the Caesars or the doubloons. And the others, I added with disgust, I won't have the damnable things in my home. Very well, here it is then. I know you're acquainted from your miskatonic years with the Palachal-Skr-Galar-Gactracts. He uttered a bizarre phrase and a ghastly ululation that made me cringe with distaste. I gripped the arms of my chair, only to be accosted again by that infernal smile. The utterance disquieted me in part because the man's command of that eldritch language was only possible by a native speaker of that tongue a language unspoken for millennia outside the cloistered halls of esoteric academia and certain ancient mouldering New England seafaring towns long collapsed into legend, myth, and the fear of writers such as Lovecraft and Blackwood, my own namesake if rumour of distant relations was to be believed. Not wishing to lose face before one whom I knew was born of a hybrid race of semi-humanity more at home in the ocean depths than on land, I quickly got hold of myself and waited for him to continue. There is a collection of these obscure tracts, volumes 1 to 17 in the Miskatonic Library and housed beneath subterranean stacks, for which you yourself, sir, were the sole curator for many years, he said, matter-of-factly. You long suspected and were quite correct. There is a total of twenty-five such tracts that comprise the whole of the scripture 
including the eat, remaining at large, sequestered in a guarded place none but a few could ever hope to locate. Is this not the position of the current scholarship on the matter? He asked, glancing furtively into the gloom that clung to the corners of the room beyond reach of the fire's wholesome glow. You are correct, but how in blazes do you know of my work? I demanded. And on what grounds do you call me back into matters I abandoned decades ago? Before we may begin, sir, he replied, leaning towards me, whereupon I recoiled without thinking at his approach. I must have your solemn oath that you will assist me in all that our undertaking shall demand of us, and these demands may prove quite perilous, yet rewarding beyond imagination. I pray that my certain knowledge of your work and the mention of the palachal tract shall suffice to prove my integrity in soliciting your aid. I must protest. I need more from you than a pack of vague allusions to my work. I require much more if I am to plunge headlong into mysterious activities that you suggest may prove dangerous to our persons. So be it, then, he said, rifling through his coat pocket and producing three slender volumes bound in badly worn yellow leather, embossed in crimson with the infernal script. He pressed them into my hand, and when I saw what they were, they almost fell from my hand. Yes, you see before you volumes 18 to 20, of the tracts. I assure you they are quite genuine and have been in my possession and that of my line for countless generations. You needn't conceal your shock, Dr. Blackwood. I know you have never seen volumes 18 to 20, and you had given up hope of ever doing so. These you may study overnight. You will see that I have fully translated them as far as my skills were able to achieve, yet I believe they faithfully convey the gravity and import their author intended. Dr. Blackwood, I know where the final volumes are held. Please, allow me to finish before I field your inquiries, he said as I stiffened in my chair and opened my mouth to speak. My activities have long been under the scrutiny of those I would seek most fiercely to evade, he continued without pause, with constant surveillance by parties both known and unknown to me, it became imperative that I enlist your assistance at this time to ensure perhaps not only my own safety and the safety of the tracts, but perchance leading to a satisfactory and onerous conclusion to your own life's work. It is the content of these three volumes that places me in such peril, and which is of so critical a nature that we, you and I, should you agree to assist me, must secure the remaining five volumes from their abode of concealment, and deliver them into saner and more benevolent hands than the villainous traitors who strive against me. Be forewarned, sir, he continued gravely. The tracts you hold contain signs and portents of things never even hinted in the earlier seventeen volumes. I will not demand of you an answer tonight. I can see you are quite shaken. I shall take my leave now, but I will return, if you permit, tomorrow night, at the same hour, to see where things stand between us. But what could they possibly contain of such magnitude beyond a scholarly passion for antiquities and the arcane oeuvre of long-dead madmen? I asked, dreading whatever answer may be forthcoming. The three tracts I have shown you may only be called a revelation, a new magisterial utterance from a being known to us only as the 
prophet behind the stars. I will say more tomorrow night when I call upon you again. You will have read the tracts, made your decision, and you will give me your solemn reply. If you agree, then we must begin at once. Is that clear? I nodded my agreement, and then he was gone. I sat in disbelief, the beginnings of a smile at the edges of my lips. A sharp footfall on the landing outside my door brought me to my feet, thinking perhaps the fellow had returned with some afterthought. I opened the door, but the place was deserted, and the house was silent. I went to the window and looked down into the street where my visitor was pacing back and forth in the glow of a street lamp, glancing up and down the foggy lane as if awaiting the arrival of someone or dreading the same. Another footfall on the landing, and I glanced angrily towards the door. When I looked again, the creature had vanished. I went again to my door and listened, but there was nothing. I hadn't even had the fellow's name, nor had I asked, knowing it would be as unpronounceable and unintelligible as the name of those dreaded tracts he had foisted upon me, and which now lay menacingly upon my table. I bolted the door with the second lock, and set the sigil of protection and my seal upon it, a thing I had not bothered to do in many a year. Then I lighted the lamp, put on my spectacles, and set about examining the tracts. My hands trembling with anticipation, the pages were meticulously translated into English, although in a very antiquated and formal style common a century or more ago. I could understand them easily enough, having worked with so many obscure old manuscripts in my time. Copious notes and numerical formulae crowded the margins in that malignant antediluvian cipher native to creatures such as my visitant. He was an unusually refined and human-like specimen in general appearance and comportment, no doubt cultured to cohabit with the human population of Fisher's Keep. The manner in which the script seemed to dance and flutter across the pages, to rise in frothy undulations and then disappear as mist before my eyes, evoked more than a slight discomfort, and forced me to take numerous respites from the work at hand. The tracts were objectionable in the extreme, and hinted at cosmic abominations and singular irregularities well beyond the frightfully odious content of the first seventeen volumes that we, and I realised I had said we, held in trust at the Miskatonic Library. I contemplated the three volumes without scepticism, knowing well the provenance of the original seventeen and the oddly familiar person of my visitor himself. Yet, what lay before me was outside the same boundaries of anything I had ever encountered in the forbidden catacombs beneath the pyramids at Cairo, or on any of my secret expeditions into lands even now I am loath to admit and recall. The most startling thing about the tracts was their claim to be the words of this prophet beyond the stars himself, a being I had never even heard of before this very night, despite my academic familiarity with numerous eldritch monstrosities and still living denizens and deities of hidden subterranean swamps and the unlit catacombs of human madness. As I considered these grim tidings, I felt the first warming rays of the sun creep across my face. I locked the volumes away in a small metal-lined valise, guarded under lock and key and a number of warding devices and spoken formulae, tucked the thing under my bed, and retired for a sleepless vigil. I arose at eleven, and consuming the remains of the morning's repast, I plunged into a closer examination of the tracts. Volumes 1 to 17 had long been studied by devoted academics and students, myself highly prominent among them. We enjoyed a specialised command of dead or forbidden languages and the scriptures of numerous profane sects subsumed in prehistory, those worships supposedly long dead and wiped from the face of the earth long before the coming of man, when elder races and a pantheon of gods held dominion over the earth. Legend speaks guardedly of cataclysmic events, of cosmic proportions, which forced these ancient gods to flee, 
some returning to the very stars from which they came to hide in secret, while others took refuge in the waters of the great oceans, deep within the unexplored frozen depths where no man dares venture forth to fish or drop his nets. One particular neo-race, itself old beyond imagining, had entered into alliances of mutual benefit with the fringes of pre-humanity. That race was known in our discipline as the Deep Ones, of whom my visitor had clearly been a member of the highest order. The two races, human and Batrachian, cohabited along the more remote sea coasts of antiquity in the Mediterranean, among the remains of certain ancient South Sea Island folk in the farthest reaches of the British Isles, and here in the crumbling forgotten seaports of New England. These Batrachians, and certain foolhardy specimens among humanity's eldritch lineages, had, upon occasion, married or otherwise commingled to produce a hybrid folk at home in both the waters and upon the land. Their descendants built up peculiar sorts of lodging and mercantile establishments, traded with their neighbours and lived among them, adopting their modes of behaviour and speech in a stilted dialect easily recognisable by locals in the region and far-flung academics and other specialists beyond. The translator, as I came to think of him, had all but mastered human speech, although in that typically outdated and halting manner, and I marvelled at his skill with translation. I retired then to my desk, brandy in hand, and placed the locked valise on the table. Releasing the seals, I put the key in the lock and opened the case, then staggered back and fell into my chair. The blasted valise was empty, yet I knew with absolute certainty I had locked and warded the treatises before I retired. I had not dreamed any such outlandish thing, and there was absolutely no evidence of any stealthy nocturnal activity in my rooms. The window remained locked as I had left it before retiring, but it remained. The confounded treatises were nowhere to be found in the flat. I spent the day consumed with foreboding that nearly paralysed me. When at the appointed hour there came a knock, I flung the door open and admitted the translator to my rooms. There was no point in forestalling the catastrophic news, so I confessed all to him before he had cleared my doorstep. I had lost, for what other explanation could there be, the precious volumes he had entrusted upon me only the night before. His broad mouth rippled briefly with chirped laughter. Then he paused, looking at me with genuine disbelief. I can't fathom what you mean by this, unless you jest with me and your humour is so very arcane that I am at loss to grasp its meaning, he said, not showing the least alarm in my admission. I make no jest, I gasped. I am in dread, earnest, and beg your deepest pardon and counsel as to what is to be done. Well then, I cannot parry your meaning, so I will show you he said, his voice thin and peaked with slight irritation. Reaching into his pocket, he brought out the packet of slender volumes. You see, Dr. Blackwood, they are here, safe upon my person as they have remained since we last spoke. Never, never would I have parted with them before I had secured your solemn oath in this manner, he added, tapping his chest after returning them to the pocket of his coat. But I thought I was to examine the tracts and tell you my decision when you returned, I explained, thoroughly befuddled. No, no, my good fellow, he croaked deeply in surprise. Never did any such words pass my lips. But tell me, then, if, as you believe, you had the tracts in your possession through the night, did you delve into their pages, he asked regaining his usual guarded solemnity. Yes, of course. I read them completely. Why, I spent the whole night, until first light, perusing them quite carefully. I am not mad, I tell you, nor was this any dream. The tracts were here. Then this morning, they were gone. 
harm yourself, sir. As you see, I have them with me. Now, may I ask, do you perchance recall anything of particular interest contained therein? He queried, drawing his chair a bit closer to mine. How could one forget the harbinger of such wanton evil and such profound... Why, I am utterly at a loss for words. I don't know what to say. I can recall now but a single line from the lot. I jumped up and began pacing the room, my hands combing wildly through my hair as my eyes swept the room like beacons upon a stormy sea. Yes, and what is the one line you now recall? He prompted with expectation. Who? I began, but my words caught in my throat. Who is the prophet behind the stars? The single line I now recall quite plainly is, I am the prophet behind the stars. The translator sat back into his chair. Well, Dr. Blackwood, it seems you have been spoken to. The volumes have shown you their voice and bid you welcome. Now will you assist me in freeing the last seventeen volumes from their unconscionable confinement in the Miskatonic University Library Archives, and in undertaking the rescue of the remaining five tracts from those who hold them in a far distant and more inhospitable terrain? What say you, Dr. Blackwood? He concluded, though I could barely see those huge lidless eyes. I could feel their gaze upon me, and I tensed. Yes, I said with the force of a curse, my fist pounding once upon the table. There was no turning back. I will aid you in any way I can, but you must tell me everything. I began, but he cut me off with a swift chop of his hand. Of course, I do not intend to drag you blindly into all that I see before us, but you must understand, as I said, I remain under constant and relentless surveillance by two factions who would possess the entirety of the tracts at all costs. One of them is a cadre of my own kinsmen, foul traitors whom I once believed to be allies, comrades, and friends, he said bitterly, his lips recoiling in disgust. I see, I began. A not uncommon theme among those vying for treasures of great and inestimable value. No, sadly, but it is the others who present the greatest threat and force me to enlist your aid at this time. You see, there are certain priests among them who... Priests, I hissed, and this time it was I who cut him off. I blanched at the thought of it that perhaps there might be some ancient lineage of unimaginable monstrosity mobilized in unknown places against us. I began to wonder if agreeing to help this strange person might prove a foolhardy misadventure I would soon regret. Yes, priests, for that is what they are, after a fashion, prelates of unbounded ministerial authority and sacramental right in matters we are to tread deeply, yet most gently upon. He paused to give me time to digest all he had said. And these, these priests, are of your kind? They are most definitely not, neither born nor created in this world, and its vulnerable, hapless legions I pray you never see them fully formed as I have by the light of day, for they are quite disturbing to behold, and not easily forgotten, he explained, but they are always nearby, even now, venturing forth through tunnels of time, not confined to the material domains, they most assuredly will stand against us, for the tracts are their most sacred scripture, a revelation, a promise, and a warning from their prophet unto the earth. Rest assured, Dr. Blackwood, we, you and I, do not wish to see this thing come to pass. Now, as agreed upon between us two, 
the work must commence immediately. First, we will retrieve the tracts held at the library at which you are well known and afforded unquestioned entry. Then we secrete them away to a secure haven I have prepared for this. If this is agreeable, we shall depart for the library now, he said, with the same tone with which he might be suggesting an affable pint down at the old stick. I agreed but not without reluctance, and soon enough we were descending into the basement of the Miskatonic University Library, a place I had not visited in quite some time. Fortunately, I remained a well-known figure in these environs, and we raised only the briefest odd glance from the aged clerk when the translator doffed his hat and nodded silently at the fellow. The old chap knew me well and thought it quite in keeping with accepted protocol that I materialize unannounced in the dead of night with an odd companion to undertake some undisclosed work within the stacks. Down and down we descended, past the dark marble staircases until we came to narrow spiralling stairs of iron, then humble stairs of wood, long unvarnished, thick with dust and creaking loudly at my every step though the translator seemed to tread more lightly than I, and his footfall made no sound. We navigated down hallways of long unused rooms, filled with unclassified and unclassifiable artifacts, specimens and curiosities of all kinds. Finally we stood at the end of a corridor, lined with oil sconces. I had never been down this far below the general collections and archival stacks, and found it distressing that the manuscripts I had dictated my life's work to had been sequestered in such undignified surroundings. The translator stopped before a small door, and producing a key from his pocket, he unlocked it. If you will follow me, he instructed, taking a lamp from the wall where it hung on a hook and lighting it. A ghastly green glow erupted, a bit too spiritedly for my tastes, but I followed my companion without lament before I was stopped dead in my tracks. Before us lay yet another staircase, spiralling down into the earth, its grandiose width and preposterous construction such that a dozen men could descend abreast. But the thing itself near took my breath away. Its intricately carved marble balustrades depicted a swarming maelstrom of sea life frolicking in the foaming surf, some familiar while others were utterly foreign and unknown to me. The majority of the depictions, however, were the substance of nightmares and infernal, chaotic madness. The faces of the pernicious fiends writhed in malignant ecstasy that caused me to wonder at the nature of its artisans and the purpose of such clearly devotional images. At the bottom of the staircase, a warren of dimly lit tunnels carved into the rock of the earth flowed in all directions, their sconces flickering dully with green flame, many dripping languidly from an unknown source. We walked for some time in silence while I marvelled at my surroundings before venturing a comment. Are the original tracks that I laboured upon for so many years now quartered down here? I barked incredulously. They are indeed, but you must not presume they were secreted here by the clerks and good students of the Miskatonic Library. Oh no, my good sir, they were taken from here in a stealthy manner and placed down here upon my orders for more secure keeping. Circumstances have changed somewhat though, and he stopped suddenly and put a hand to his lips. Impossible though it seemed, the sound of furtive movement echoed in the distance. The sound of footfalls, muffled voices, and a scuttling as of vast hordes of tiny creatures advancing down an adjacent tunnel, while the sound of softly padded feet could be heard running beneath our feet. <sighs> I spluttered, but he clapped a gloved hand firmly over my mouth, and we waited until all was again silent. I am not the only one to use these tunnels, Dr. Blackwood. Not the only one, by far. Let us continue in silence. And please, proceed as lightly as you can. I told you I was being followed. Wait a minute, I whispered, grabbing his sleeve, then recoiling when he turned and bared his teeth at me briefly, 
then brandished his wan smile. Are you afraid for your own safety down here? I demanded. Dr. Blackwood, all who venture down here would be very well advised to tread carefully and in fear, he said in a clipped and chastising manner I had not detected before. We waited for several more minutes, then continued down the tangle of hallways, some leading straight down into the earth, others nothing more than rough holes bored into the stone walls at confusing and irregular angles. Now, even though a bookish man much of my life, I had embarked upon some rather perilous expeditions in my time and prided myself on a stout courage in most matters, as well as being something of an amateur pugilist in my youth. But I had learned always to be on my guard where noises in the dark, for which I could discern no clear and rational source, are in play. I became aware then of a rising sense of elation as my thoughts soared joyously within me. I stopped and gazed upward, feeling unmistakably called, invited to rise upward through the vast firmament and into the embrace of the very stars themselves, where a glorious awakening awaited me. I longed for this, surrendering to the succulent voice that whispered as seductively as any siren, his caresses exciting in me a hunger I have never before experienced. I almost screamed in rage and anguish when a hand grabbed me by the shoulder. I turned towards the miscreant, determined to rain my fists upon him. Instead, I looked into the face of the translator, his eyes still hidden behind his dark glasses. That unseen gaze immediately cleared my head, and I looked about as the last of the intoxicating mists fled uncoiling from my mind. I had been attempting to climb the walls as though upon a ladder. I needed no further admonishment and we continued on. We turned down yet another tunnel, where every surface was resplendent with a fine luminescent moss that twinkled in the lamplight as the stars in the firmament. I cringed hearing the soft lapping of sluggish waters nearby. The reflection of an undulating current rippled across the ceiling, and the splash of dripping water drew so close to my ear that I flinched repeatedly. But there was nothing there, and the sound halted immediately, as if to avoid detection. I said nothing. The translator was clearly unmoved by these peculiarities, so I steeled myself against any further intrusions, and soldiered on. My mind began to wander, but I closed myself against any further encroachment upon the privacy of my thoughts and person, while the crash of cymbals in the caverns beneath our feet and the tinkling of bells poured from the very air itself, but again drew no response from my silent companion. I told you these tunnels lead to many places, none of which, besides this one, is of any concern of ours, lest we alert other travellers or their inhabitants to our presence, he hissed. Some while later, my companion stopped abruptly before a tall alcove in the wall. Here was enshrined a disturbingly lifelike graven basalt image of one of the old gods, its hideous leering face and great drooping wings hanging slack at its sides like a cloak seemed to mock our very existence. The translator took yet another key from his pocket and inserted it into the thing's mouth, turning it in an intricate series of gestures the surface of the statue, at least seven feet in height, swung open upon silent hinges. Ordering me to wait outside, the fellow disappeared into the darkened space beneath the statue. The miasmal fragrance of nocturnal growing things was so heavy I could hardly breathe. Soon my companion returned, shut and relocked the demoniac shrine. Then we turned and retraced our steps accosted frequently by footfalls above and below, and the muffled flapping of wings in the corridors adjacent to our own. Once the translator stopped and thrust me back against the wall of the tunnel with a firm strong arm like a steel bar. 
A moment later, the slow, rhythmic pulse of massive, beating wings filled the tunnel as an impenetrable darkness slowly drifted past. When we no longer heard the beating of those wings, we proceeded on, though the translator offered no explanation. Two or three times we passed tall and heavily gated doorways behind which rose desperate pleas for help or raging curses as someone or something sought to escape some hideous fate. Several times a moist flutter brushed against my face as if some unearthly paramour sought to lure me to unhallowed delights. I flinched and my companion glanced at me as though he knew exactly against what I struggled. It was a relief when we finally climbed back into the more familiar levels of the library. The translator tapped his breast and proffered his damnable smile to indicate he had successfully retrieved the purloined tracts from that infernal shrine. We retired to my rooms at the Essex house, but I was keenly aware that we had indeed been followed, for the hair on the back of my neck prickled at every shadow or footfall. You're sure they cannot enter my rooms? I asked nervously, recalling the sound of hoarse, unnatural breath and the snuffling clicks and chittering that followed us to my front door. They cannot enter as long as we remain diligent, he began as I stoked the fire in the grate to life and the illusion of warmth and safety filled the room. I have certain signs and seals which will aid us, as you have your own wards which I detected when I entered your lair that first night, he assured me, and I snorted with laughter at his reference to my lair. The translator sat at the table before the hearth and proceeded to lay out the yellowed volumes he had retrieved from the subterranean catacombs. Instead of laying them so he might read their contents, he arranged them in rows and little stacks resembling certain layouts of the tarot. He did this several times, nodding and pondering as he rearranged them in even more confounding patterns that dizzied my senses. Without opening them, he seemed to consume their contents through his gloved fingertips, shuffling them so rapidly I saw nothing but a blur. At last he gathered the pages together and aligned them in the fashion of a deck, then laid them aside. Things have progressed beyond expectation. This, though to our advantage must be acted swiftly upon, or we may lose that advantage, he began. But what in blazes are we to do? What are we up against? What are our goals? I demanded. I have told you, we must find the remaining volumes of the text at all costs, even to our mortal peril. To this you have already agreed, he croaked his guttural voice, losing much of its affectation to human speech. Yes, I exclaimed, but I refuse to go one step further without a clear understanding of our plan. That will only be revealed as we proceed, step by step. Now we must repair to a small island that is known to my people. There we will find an oracle of sorts that will prove most useful. That is all I can tell you now, he growled, glaring at me, and I knew well enough to keep my thoughts to myself. We leave now. Bring what you may need for a journey of unknown duration. I gathered up a few things I thought I might need, along with my luger and as much ammunition as I could carry in my knapsack. That, the translator snorted, nodding at my pistol will be of little use to you, but bring it if you find comfort in it. And so we were off. I closed the door behind me, taking in the pleasant surroundings of my rooms, for perhaps the very last time. We ventured on through the failing afternoon light and descended into the gloom of the decayed ancient piers of Old Front Street. Once the scene of a thriving whaling trade, one of the busiest seaports of a century and a half ago, the waterfront was long abandoned to moulder and collapse forever into the sea. The old wharf was not long for this world, and already some of its rotted beams had sunk into the brackish waters. 
we entered a ruined warehouse where light poured through the ceiling in places where the roof was nothing but a distant memory. Everywhere was blackened and green with age and reeked of the sea. Heaps of burned-out timbers covered with lichen and luminescent fungi littered the ground, and grotesque barnacles of impossible design lay about in strange little heaps that seemed to turn and face us as we passed. I was glad we hurried through this miasma, though I scarcely imagined our final destination to be anything more wholesome. Down here, quickly, the translator whispered urgently, gesturing to a rough stone stairway that spilled into the unlit bowels of the earth that was lighted well enough for us to see by the unearthly glow of the foul-smelling lichen that covered the walls and ceiling. We climbed downward for quite some time, then finally set foot upon the spongy earth of a dilapidated subterranean pier. I gagged and turned to retreat back the way we had come. The stench was sweltering with noxious luminescent spores that filled the air and clung to my face and hands and twinkled with devil's fire. Again I felt a hand upon my shoulder and the translator dragged me back to face him. Breathe slowly, he commanded. You will acclimate in time, he warbled abandoning the last pretenses of humanity in his speech and bearing. He was lumbering from side to side now as well, seeming more at home in this horrendous tableau than by the cheery fire in my homey little parlour. Gritting my teeth, I waded into the sluggish muck that slogged against my knees, probing against my flesh with its vile caresses. I thought I would go mad but clung to the tiny bobbing light of the translator's lamp. I had not even noticed when he procured it from somewhere along the way, but knew he only carried it for my comfort and had no need of it himself. Countless things slithered furtively beneath the surface of the sluggish waters, their greenish fluorescence disappearing quickly from sight as I approached, while other things clung to my pant legs, their slurping sound a deafening cacophony. I prayed they were merely ordinary leeches and kicked wildly, hoping to dislodge the filthy creatures, but only managed to kick water onto the translator, who glanced sharply back at me and then turned away. We treaded on and came to a crudely formed iron door, thick with lichen and moss. Yet another key was produced, and soon we were out onto a rocky beach that lay somewhere below the town, hidden beneath dark, unscalable cliffs, where no sun shone in the sky. A narrow stretch of land, leading away over the waters, disappeared into heavy curtains of drifting fog. We took this path, but I could not see more than a few feet ahead of me. After another indeterminate period of time, a small island appeared that was likely swallowed by the waves at high tide. A decrepit little boat carried us to its muddy shores that were alive with the clinging shapes of bizarre mollusks and shelled things as well as dead things left behind by the receding waters. It was the hideous black cairn that rose menacingly from the centre of the isle that caused the hair on the back of my neck to stand up. I managed to remain resolute and stayed the course, dogging my companion's footsteps as we climbed impossibly steep narrow stairs to the central altar that writhed with a horde of unrecognisable creatures that slithered back into the mud lest we tread upon them. The translator opened the devilishly carved iron doors of a tabernacle at the centre of the altar, also covered with the unhallowed script, and brought forth a peculiar sort of orb, emblazoned with a gelatinous green light that crept over the thing's surface as an oily slime. There were several distinct hand depressions worked onto either side, whose outlines pulsed a dull red. My companion removed one of his gloves and pressed his right hand into one of the indentations where it fit snugly as if made for him alone. Then he gestured for me to do the same with my own left hand into the accompanying, markedly webbed indentation. What are you saying? I gasped, 
shaking my head and stumbling away. He was too quick for me and grabbed me painfully by the shoulder and dragged me back to the orb with the strength of half a dozen good-sized louts. Do as I say, he barked in that oddly sibilant tone that brooked no argument. It is far too late for any childish nonsense from you, and there is so much that you still must know. Now, place your hand there, and be quick about it. Then, dare you to be whole, he demanded sharply, and I could do nothing but comply. The moment I touched it, the sphere began to vibrate beneath my hand as low warbling voices murmured a darkly melodious chant. What I found most disturbing was that our two hands fit so perfectly into the handprints, his with the webbing between the Batrachian fingers and my own print, the same. I bellowed in defiance and outrage as the sphere trembled more violently, but I could not drag my hand away. I watched in speechless horror as the fleshy webbing between my own fingers began to expand to an alarming degree and then quickly recede. My stomach heaved and I recoiled as a flood of images crashed into my brain and threatened to destroy my mind. Then, mercifully, I knew no more. I awoke back in my rooms as if from too much strong drink and a long night's debauchery, certain that the evening's misadventures had been nothing but a fevered dream. Hearing the clearing of a guttural throat nearby, I sat up and looked around. The translator was seated near the fire, his gloved hands leafing through an unfamiliar, worn volume, bound in deep crimson. How... Did I? I began. My mouth parched as I examined my hands and found them as normal to my way of thinking as they should be. I brought you here, of course, he replied thinly, without turning from the pages he studied. And you needn't worry yourself any further. What you recall of last night's activities is true, he added, flatly. But how can I be? I muttered but broke off and fell back onto the blankets on my bed. You have no idea, he scoffed. I know every name of my own lineage back a thousand generations. Have you no such knowledge of your own? He added, his voice returning to that of a refined but modest pretender to humanity. Are these things then of no importance to you? Yes, but, well... How is one to know? Why would I? I don't... Well, I don't look at... I've never suspected that... I began, but he shut me down by slamming the book and coming to loom angrily down upon me. You do not command so handsome a visage as I. No, decidedly not. And yet it remains. You and I are the same, far more than you may know. Like so many others unknown to you, it is true, Dr. Blackwood, you bear none of the noble characteristics typical of myself, sadly. Perhaps in time you will learn to speak and take pride in your lineage. The truth is carried in the secret places within your blood, and that blood is needed to fight the prophet behind the stars and his insidious minions, worshippers, acolytes, and most especially his accursed priesthood, as well as those who blindly serve him among my kind and yours. Is this much clear to you? He demanded, as though delivering a dire pontification on a stormy Easter morn. All was indeed clear for how could I deny what I was forced to witness within myself in that unhallowed tabernacle? I lay silent for a moment, attempting to feel the beating of my heart, the pulse of non-human blood hiding deep within my veins, 
the cells and organs of my body, vast eons of memories crowding my own, searching for any clues I might be anything other than just a man, an ordinary man in the declining years of my life. I thought back on that bane globe and the maelstrom of visions I had been forced to endure. Life within the blackest Neptunian deep, among strange fellows such as the translator among kin. What manner of creatures would bring that orb to bear upon some unfathomable campaign of what dread meaning I could not glean? How could I both fear and long to behold these things? I struggled as the cresting surface of my consciousness drowned me once more in visions, and I fought for understanding. At length the translator rose, looking down at me with undisguised pity. Then he moved towards the door, obviously preparing to take his leave. Wait, I cried out, leaping to my feet. Wait, where are you going? What is our next move? When do we begin? When, he replied wistfully, when? You have first so very much to learn, beginning with the meaning of time. There is no when outside of the human sphere, that sad little tableau of the briefest span within which its denizens remain trapped, unknowing like flies in a glittering web. Conquer first the meaning of time as it is for those whose memories flow as a verdant wave to all places and to nowhere. Learn to wear time like a robe of royal hue, fly upon its wings as with your own, and come to stand within those halls where there is only this moment, the absolute and ultimate now. You will see the numberless roads emanating from it and the dread and glorious places to which they lead. When the tides are right, and the stars fall like tears upon a bain and hungry sea. Then I will return for you. With this, and to my utter shock, he was gone, and I sat as one lost within the trackless wastes of dream, where I knew not who was the dreamer, and who was I. How many years ago that was I have long ago lost count. I endeavoured for some time to wipe it all from my memory as merely the desperate fantasies of a man fighting to regain the faded muse of his creative spirit. But alas, the translator and what he had revealed to me was never far from my thoughts, an unseen companion in the vast innumerable halls of a ghostly memory where it was I who was the haunting spectre. After some years had passed, I was struck with another debilitating malaise. I was aging, of course, and who can say what mysteries accompany us down the passageways into those dimming shores which precede our death. My skin lost its supple youth, and I had to apply soothing unguents many times throughout the day. Then, to my surprise, this resolved. My hands were perhaps the most startling of the early changes, and of course the loss of my hair and the exposed pate that was highly sensitive to burn with the slightest rays of the sun, which had also begun to plague my eyes. The days flowed strangely as a languid river through empty spaces. Sometimes I remembered all and marvelled at the transformation that consumed my body and ignited my mind with such preternatural longing for things I had yet to behold in this life. Other days I had no knowledge of this, and one by one, in desperate rage and confusion, I destroyed all the mirrors I had kept in my lair to mark the passage of these miraculous changes upon me. It was then, I don't recall exactly when, I abandoned my rooms at the Essex in favour of a dilapidated and nearly deserted lodging down on Old Wharf Street by the shunned docks whose only activity prevailed on those moonless nights when odd lamps could be seen flickering here and there and then disappearing quickly from sight 
as if their merest observation caused them to scatter to unseeable hiding places. The denizens of the Essex had begun to look upon me with pity, and then disgust, leaping from their places at table if I happened to appear at mealtimes. It was best I retire to more suitable quarters, to live out my days in peace and not as a scourge upon my genteel fellow lodgers. I had begun to lay abed all day as well, only rising and taking to the streets at dusk, and conducting my affairs, such as they were, among the concealing shadows. It was the dreams, however, that consumed me abed by day, and provided the most remarkably fertile and fecund horizons of these my later years, and the landscapes of a full interior life. I awaken refreshed, and renewed with all I had seen and done in those curious environs that always welcomed me as my head nodded, my eyes drooped, and I became lost and a stranger to this world. Always the import of these dreams was clear, the signs and portents of time and its meaning beyond the banal concerns and interests of mankind. I came to recognise in the tides and backwaters of time itself the very source and wellspring of thought in all its forms. I had grown long used to this perpetual routine and scarcely recalled more than fragments of my days at the Essex, precious little of what comprised my life before that. So it was quite the surprise when one evening there came a sharp, insistent rap at my door, muffled as with a gloved hand, demanding, yet curiously melodious. This intrusion I ignored, hoping it was merely a dropped book or a fumbled step from an adjourning garret or some fatal altercation among the ragged hooligans who inhabit the streets below. But no, the sound came again more insistently, so I went to the door to rouse the laggard and toss him out on his ear. The sound once again came more urgently, demanding immediate entry. Envision the shock upon my face, when the door swung open and there stood a man upon my threshold, buried in the dark thick folds of a heavy greatcoat, a wide-brimmed hat of foreign design upon his head, thick leather gloves and dark impenetrable glasses that seemed to cover half his face, and leaning heavily upon his curiously carved walking stick. I believe I must have grasped him to me, or attempted to, but he stiffened and I stepped back and gazed at him. I was utterly speechless, and all I could do was wait for him to speak. It is time, was all he said, and I nodded, understanding all, whereupon I retreated to my place of sleeping, where I slid on my thick leather gloves and greatcoat donned my wide-brimmed hat of foreign design that protected me from the sun's relentless assault, and placed the dark glasses over my lidless and unblinking eyes. Lastly, I took up the curiously carved walking stick into my hand from its place near my bed, and gathered up the texts and sacred documents where they had always lain in the box I secreted beneath my bed for safekeeping. I went then, to join the translator at my doorstep. But of course he was gone, as I knew he would be. So I shouldered my few belongings and set out from Fisher's Keep for the last time. There was, after all, so very much work to be done, and perhaps not so much time.